Where's it going to be? Okay, it's good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Maria Figueroa Kupchu. I'm a senior research fellow here at the New America Foundation and a co director of the Privatization of Foreign Policy Initiative. Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us in person and also to those who are watching us on the web. This event is a live webcast on the New America Foundation site. We're delighted that so many of you uh, have come out for today's presentation of a new report launched here at New America called the Revitalizing U.S. Democracy Promotion, a Comprehensive <clears throat> Plan for Reform. And um, this report is part of the Privatization of Foreign Policy Initiative, which is one of the programs here at the Think Tank uh, focused on the impact of non-state actors in U.S. foreign policy and, and kind of examining how groups like nonprofit organizations, NGOs, uh, private corporations, even private individuals are having an increasingly influential role in the design of American foreign policy and its implementation. So as part of the project, which um, I co-direct along with Michael Cohen here, uh, we are looking at various spheres of U.S. foreign policy from national security to democracy promotion and development, even global health, and, and taking a look at how non-state actors are affecting uh, the way that the U.S. approaches these, these issues. Um, let me thank, first of all, all the people who helped to bring this report to life. Um, this was a multi-month process uh, which involved interviewing experts from different walks of life and different disciplines. Several of the participants who were interviewed for this report and who took part in an off-the-record expert group joined me here on the panel today and are also in the room. Um, I'd also like to thank the Georgetown University Law Center, which was a co-host with us of the um, proceedings, the New America Foundation staff, and in particular Faith Smith at the back, who is our fearless helper in this process. <laughs> um, we undertook this work on democracy promotion based on the notion that the field had changed quite dramatically um, over the course of kind of 30 to 40 years, and that the involvement of different types of groups, um, different non-state actors, had really started to um, raise some interesting questions about how this work um, kind of evolved. Did you say turn <laughs> off the sound? Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't this where you're supposed to say that right? <laughs> and there you go. Um, so, you know, kind of our, Michael and I both, in fact, come from a political uh, consulting background, and having advised candidates in other countries, we're quite taken with the notion that, you know, this <coughs> global professional group of democracy promotion actors and activists were kind of talking with one another around the world and kind of seeding ideas um, around the world. And we're interested to learn a bit more about how this field was developing, professionalizing, and how it was becoming regarded as a more important um, aspect of U.S. foreign policy. Enter the Bush administration, of course, which elevated kind of the rhetoric around democracy promotion um, and put it at the center of much of its work. And, you know, now we have kind of emerged from that era. And the, the conversation here today is about how would an Obama administration, as it um, kind of develops an emerging Obama doctrine, where is the place for democracy promotion in the efforts that it will undertake in, in foreign policy? And I think for, for those of you who follow this area quite closely, as I know you do, there's been a lot of writing in the, in the papers recently about you know, whether the Obama administration is backing off from commitments, whether it's about to say something, um, you know, whether it intends to engage more vigorously through multilateral channels, what will be the shape of the democracy promotion and, and more largely the development assistance work in our foreign policy going forward. And that's one of the topics that we'd like to um, explore today here with all of you. So let me introduce our panel. And uh, I think what we'll like to have is a recap of the report by Michael to kind of point to some of the highlights uh, of the recommendations that we have come to in the process of this research. And the report is available uh, in the room behind. And then we'd like each of the panelists to make some, some comments before we open up to kind of more free-flowing discussion. Um, let me briefly introduce everyone. Michael Cohen uh, is also co-director of the Prioritization of Foreign Policy Initiative here at New America. He is the author, most recently, of Live from the Campaign Trail, the greatest presidential campaign speeches of the 20th century and how they shaped modern America. 
Uh, he is a board member of the newly formed National Security Network, which focuses on increasing grassroots involvement in U.S. foreign policy. And he is a very um, active contributor in, to the New York Times, Politico.com, and blogs at democracyarsenal.com. He has been a chief speech writer for um, U.S. State Department and for U.S. Representative um, Stuart Eisenstadt and Bill Richardson. Um, Tom Melia here is currently Deputy Executive Director at Freedom House. Uh, he's had a distinguished career in democracy promotion work, uh, serving for more than a dozen years at NDI uh, from 1998 to 2001. He was the Institute's Vice President for Programs, and he is also uh, an adjunct professor at the School of Foreign Service at Georgetown University. Chris Homan is currently Foreign Policy Advisor to uh, Senator Richard Durbin, Democrat of Illinois. Uh, he's the former Director of Iraq Programs at NDI and has been involved in U.S. Congressional and Presidential campaigns, also serving as City Council Member of Southern Maryland. And Ted Picone is a Senior Fellow and Deputy Director for Foreign Policy at Brookings, where he works uh, largely on foreign policy towards Latin America, democracy, human rights, and multilateral affairs. Uh, he serves as an advisor to the Club of Madrid, and prior to joining Brookings, he was an executive director of the Democracy Coalition Project. So with that, I'll turn it over to Michael to, um, to highlight some of the report's recommendations. Thank you, Maria. And I want to thank all the other panelists uh, for coming today and everyone else for coming out today. Um, I'll try to keep my remarks brief. We have a, a, full, a full slate here of folks to talk. Um, you know, as Maria said, you know, the cause of democracy promotion has been at the forefront of U.S. foreign policy over the past several years, and I think to an extent greater than any point uh, in recent American history. Um, you know, along with heightened rhetorical attention to uh, uh, democratization, the Bush administration's so-called freedom agenda uh, brought increased resources for democracy promotion activities and created new programs like the Millennium Challenge Corporation <laughs> and the Middle East <coughs> Partnership Initiative. Um, unfortunately, um, the verdict on the freedom agenda that I, I think many of us on this panel would agree most in this room was that it failed to fulfill its promise and in many ways actually set back America's democracy promotion efforts. But um, I think many of the problems that we've seen with the freedom agenda uh, were endemic to the foreign policy failures of the Bush administration, but they also followed a pattern that I think has come to define uh, the uncertain means by which the U.S. does democracy promotion overseas. And I want to focus on three elements of where I think the freedom agenda fell short and then three areas where I think the next administration can hopefully do better. Um, I think the first, and I think it's sort of an obvious one, is that on democracy, at least over the past several years, we talked a big game, but our follow-through wasn't... Um, wasn't quite as, uh, as good. Uh, now, George Bush was not the first president to use inflated rhetoric when talking about democracy, um, but perhaps he was the, maybe the least effective. Uh, not only did the rhetoric not always match the reality, and, and Egypt and the Palestinian elections uh, are two examples that come to mind, but as the recent release of the so-called torture memos, I think, also demonstrates, uh, we didn't practice in this country what we were preaching overseas. And if there's one, I'd say, unanimous view uh, that we heard in our research and at our conference, and I can tell you there wasn't a lot of um, unanimous views on much of anything. Uh, it was on this one issue, that namely the, the corrosive impacts um, of the obvious divide between what the U.S. was saying about democracy and what they were doing both at home and abroad on the issue. Um, the second, I think, major uh, challenge that we saw, and this again is not endemic to the Bush administration, I think this is something that we've seen repeatedly, was the politicization of democracy promotion. Um, we often talk rhetorically about democracy promotion being a long-term U.S. foreign policy objective, um, the work of generations, as, as President Bush would say. Uh, but yet we constantly over-politicize um, democracy promotion and democracy assistance. Um, one of the greatest challenges that, that always faces U.S. policymakers is how do you bridge that gap between interests um, and values? And it's a constant struggle that I think policymakers deal with. And I think it's particularly true of democracy promotion. Uh, one way that we bridge this divide is to look for ways to separate the long-term pursuit of democratization and even development from more immediate foreign policy concerns. And this was in part the idea behind the creation of the NED, uh, the National Endowment for Democracy, and the clear separation that exists between the organization and the immediate um, strategic interests of the U.S. government. But the good Bush administration was constantly guilty of conflating democracy with the country's short-term uh, political foreign policy interests. The war in Iraq being an obvious example, but again, reaction to Hamas's victory in Gaza, perhaps an even better one. Um, even worse, 
uh, was the conflation of democracy promotion with regime change. Um, you know, if the, to go back to the Hamas example, if the long-term objective of democracy promotion uh, is in America's interest, we must accept that even when those um, political movements we don't support are victorious in democratic elections. And we didn't do that in Hamas and I think undermined uh, the, the, the argument that we make on behalf of, of democracy. But I think also the problem of politicization runs deeper. Uh, too often decisions in how democracy assistance is spent uh, is based on, on short-term considerations and the heavy AID presence in Iraq and Afghanistan, two obvious examples. But also the money we spend in, in, um, in the so-called worst of the worst in authoritarian regimes like even North Korea or Iran or places where uh, precious democracy is, assistance is, is maybe not best spent um, instead of focusing on those places where it can have the most positive impact. Um, in other words, making sort of better choices in how we spend democracy assistance uh, funds. And I, I, we touched on this briefly in the report. The third thing I want to mention is also what I would call the sort of militarization of development and democracy. And I think, um, you know, we've seen this at the Pentagon. In, I think in 2000, the percent of Pentagon funds that went, or development assistance that went through the Pentagon was about 2 or 3 percent. Today it is 22 percent. Um, and I think with the so-called counterinsurgency year, um, model being adopted by the Army, this process of, of militarizing our foreign policy may continue um, going forward. And the Bush administration consistently made the military the, sort of the end of the spear uh, when it came to development democracy and shifted the balance of power and resources away from civilian agencies and toward the military. And I think it's a balance that, that needs to be shifted uh, back. And again, as I said, many of these challenges are not new. Um, they have sort of uh, continued the often the schizophrenic and sometimes short-term uh, approach to democratization that has long defined U.S. foreign policy. And that's why I think, you know, replacing one leader with another one um, is not going to solve this problem. Fixing Band-Aids isn't going to solve the problem. It, it really does speak to a need for a, a larger systemic and institutional change in how we do development and democracy, but also how we um, design our foreign assistance bureaucracy. So with that in mind, our report came up with three, a number of conclusions. I want to focus on three today that I think address some of the issues I've, I've talked about um, and I think point to a more effective uh, formulation for the foreign assistance bureaucracy. And the first recommendation, the one that we, we sort of made the foundation of the report, was creating a separate cabinet level development agency. Uh, if development and democratization are to play more prominent roles in U.S. foreign policy, a goal that I think is, is pretty much shared across the political spectrum, uh, then USAID must be placed in the upper echelons of the U.S. Uh, national security and foreign policy bureaucracy. Um, we've seen in recent years that the capacity of AID has been degraded. Um, it is, in the words of, of Pat Leahy, um, become basically a check writing agency for a handful of big Washington consultants and NGOs. Um, I was at a conference recently where I heard this number, uh, AID, and, and maybe some of the room can tell me if I'm wrong about this, but I uh, had about a dozen economists and less than 10 engineers on staff. Um, the, 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 the diminished capability at AID is, is a significant problem, and I think, um, in our view at least, the only way you can deal with this, the best way to deal with this, is to create a new uh, agency that would be able to um, have, a, have a seat at the, uh, at the policy table. And it means also giving AID its own operating budget, um, and staffing numbers should be increased to allow it to build capacity and develop the necessary expertise and key development competencies. And, uh, Chris's boss actually has introduced legislation along these lines, I think, to triple the number of AID foreign service officers. That's a step in the right direction, but I think there's more that needs to be done on this, on this issue. Um, and I think the creation, the creation of cabinet-level uh, AID would, sh again, shift the balance back from the military to civilian agencies. I think it would depoliticize a lot of the long-term development democracy work. And it will also shift power, in some ways, away from the State Department. Uh, which in recent years has taken up some of the responsibilities that I think should be located in AID, um, like, for example, offering uh, assistance. And, and, you know, one of the problems that, and Tom Milia has written um, quite a bit on this topic, uh, the fragmentation of the democracy bureaucracy. And um, we have too many agencies involved in, uh, in this work without the necessary coordination. And uh, our view is creating a, a capital agency would help to begin to ameliorate some of those, um, those challenges. Um, in addition, sharper delineations need to be made between political and strategic assistance that comes from the State Department versus development democracy assistance, um, which really should be the exclusive responsibility of AID. <coughs> and in fact, that is you know, how it's spelled out in AID's founding um, legislation. And the, uh, the, the second thing I would, I would mention is that we need to advocate um, 
or what I would advocate for, excuse me, is a further decentralization of democracy assistance. I don't mean outsourcing um, to more contractors and, and NGOs, even though I think these, these groups have a role to play. What I mean instead is engaging more directly with civil society and local actors um, in fledging democracies in semi-authoritarian states. The National Endowment for Democracy does a masterful job of this now, engaging with NGOs and fledging democracies and, and semi-authoritarian states, yet maintaining an arm's length relationship with U.S. policymakers. Um, I think we need more uh, funding for, for the net. And I just want to be clear that, again, the net is not part of the foreign assistance um, bureaucracy, just as a nod to Mike Allen. If I don't say that, I think he'll, he'll, he'll throw something at me. Uh, but it also means more support for the uh, UN Democracy Fund, more support for multilateral organizations, more support for regional organizations that are often um, much more engaged effectively in, in some of the work that we're talking about here. I think it also means more support from Millennium Challenge Corporation, uh, which, in my view at least, is one of the successes uh, of the Freedom Agenda. And uh, it's, I think, a, a very smart aid program that engages more closely with the needs of recipient countries, but also serves as an important lever for long-term political change. Um, and I think there's been, and Chris can talk more about this, but there's been a lot of pushback in Congress um, because, ironically, MCC doesn't give money away fast enough which may be the first time you'll ever hear that in Washington. Um, but that's the complaint, and I it's... Have to explain that? Yeah. <laughs> okay, you don't have to. Uh, it's sort of a short-sighted complaint, uh, because what MCC does is operates on a long-term trajectory, and it needs more, not less support from, from Congress and from uh, the executive branch. Uh, so we need more money for MCC, more patience with its long-term agenda, and I think MCC needs to do more to ensure that uh, recipient countries are engaging more closely and effectively with local actors. And finally, the point I'd also make is it means that we need to more support developing countries for institutions and not individuals. I think this is something, again, this is not uh, endemic to the Bush administration necessarily, um, but we saw a lot of it in the Bush administration, uh, focus on sort of viewing individual leaders as the, as the um, sort of carrying water for us on, on democracy and not recognizing that, in fact, um, the foundation of a sustainable and effective democracy are institutions, whether it's an effective judiciary, an independent media, um, uh, you know, the functioning legislature, all, all the elements that we know of in this country that make dem our democracy effective or you know, close to effective. Um, anyway, I, I have more I could say on, on this. I have a lot more I could say on this topic, but I will, I'll think that uh, I'll leave it on that <coughs> note and, um, and turn it over to my uh, fellow panelists Thank to uh, go deeper. Chris, I wonder if we could draw on your <coughs> unique vantage points and kind of get a read on what the appetite is on the Hill for this type of reform, and, and also you know, taking advantage of your perspective on Iraq, what, um, you know, what some of the kind of legacies are on that, um, on that front and how that might be handled going forward. Well, thank you, and thanks for the invitation. I think this is a wonderful report. The, the timing couldn't be better with the new administration and, and many talking about these issues. Um, I worked at NDI most of my career, many years under Tom Melia. I'm sure some of my insights come from that, that mentoring. And then most recently in, in Congress, although I want to point out my comments today are not formal comments of Senator Durbin's. Um, so let me talk about the view from Congress. I, I think there are probably three, three pieces of this. Um, one, <clears throat> there's a larger debate going on. It started last year about foreign assistance as a whole, and that includes democracy promotion. I think it's a healthy debate. It's been bipartisan in the last several months. In fact, there was a hearing on this last year in the House. It was standing room only. I'd never seen something like that, a line. We couldn't even get in. I'd never seen that for foreign assistance uh, hearing. Uh, that's encouraging. I think there is a growing bipartisan uh, recognition that development assistance is one of the key tools of our foreign policy or diplomatic uh, efforts. And we're hearing this from everybody, from the military, from Secretary of Defense Gates to Secretary of De uh, State Clinton. Obama has said this. My boss has said this. It's coming from many quarters. And in particular, that the military can't solve all these problems by itself. Also, that the discussion is about the neglect to our larger development community over the last few mm -hmm. years. Um, we could look at Iraq as one example. We went in there and, and toppled a dictator but had no plan. Now, some would argue that was maybe intentional, but there was no plan for the, the post-conflict uh, post period. And what could be more critical? And I think that has become uh, very evident of the need for that. And I think, as Michael said, there's a large debate now about USAID. So whether it's USAID or another agency, I would argue USAID, 
our country should have a top, premier, empowered, fully funded, fully staffed development agency. And yet today, uh, or let's start in the 60s, in the 60s USAID had 5,000 foreign service officers. And today it has 1,000 or so at a time when we have extraordinary challenges around the world. Um, when we went, Durbin and I went to Afghanistan a year or so ago, there were six or so agricultural experts in the entire country, a country struggling with opium production and yet based on agriculture, an economy based on agriculture. Incredible and short-sighted. Um, so I have to mention that Durbin and Bond and Murray and several other senators do have a bill to triple USAID's foreign service officers over the next few years. And I think the debate is also including, should it be a cabinet level? Should it have a seat at the table? Should there be a foreign assistance coordinator is called for this report? Something like that that really rebuilds our foreign assistance. Uh, so that is one debate that's going on in Congress. And democracy is a, is a piece of that. It should have a seat at the table. And, and groups like yours need to be a part of that. Um, it looks like Congressman Berman may move something later this year on, on the Foreign Assistance Act to reform that. And um, I know Senator Kerry's office is looking at this as well. So that's one piece of what's going on in Congress. Uh, the second is a little more Iraq-specific in democracy. I think historically, and Tom maybe can talk better about this, there is a bipartisan commitment and consensus to democracy promotion. And, and that's, if you think about the beginning of the Ned family under the Reagan years, that's, there was, you saw some of that or a lot of that. But the Iraq war and the Bush policies on freedom seem to have clouded the democracy issue or the, the t definition. Democracy assistance is sadly seen now as regime, regime change. Fair or unfair, that's how it is perceived. And there is a concern, I think, from some in Congress that supporting democracy programs suddenly means you may be supporting that model that has been out there the last few, few years. Um, so it's important for groups like the New America Foundation and others, those of you, the groups that you work for, to engage in this discussion and to rebuild the bipartisan consensus, particularly with so many new members in Congress that weren't there for the Cold War debates and when Reagan was involved uh, in, in the time of the NED creation and so forth. Um, and I think this has also led in Congress to some a desire to find what are more trusted routes to provide funding for democracy assistance. In the last few years, that has been often the NED, and, but that discussion continues amidst some of the mistrust from, from the Bush years. A third and final issue I think that's being debated in Congress is, and this plays into um, maybe some of the Iraq issue as well, is what about the election uh, when Hamas won? What about when Hugo Chavez wins? Are, is that what democracy promotion is really about? Should we really be getting behind this? And so there are some larger questions to wrestle with. Um, what about when we support democracy and the results are not what we'd like to see immediately? Uh, how do we as a democratic community, how are the, how do, and as a country, how do we address those, those challenges? And I think the challenge is to reshape the discussion that democracy promotion, as your report says, is the work of generations. It's long term. It's not always very glamorous. Uh, as Ken Wallach at, the, at NDI used to say, we're still in Eastern Europe two decades after the Soviet Union collapsed, building basic institutions. And so that debate needs to be a bit reshaped again. Um, I mean, after all, so many of the security problems that are on the front pages today, Pakistan, Iraq, uh, Somalia, for example, are at the core governance problems. Um, and then there's a, there's a side note of this last part. What about the failed states or the closed states? What about the Sudans or the Burmas or Somalia, depending on how you define it? How are we as a democracy community or how does Congress, how is we as the United States, how do we engage a democracy agenda with those kind of countries, which ultimately do need some kind of governing structure, but maybe there's so little to work with now. Um, and I want to I want to conclude with a, with a final part that has come up in Congress a lot that the report I thought very wisely touched, apart, touched upon is America's example matters and what we do at home and how we present our, our policy abroad has a tremendous impact on how effective our democracy programs are. So our own adherence to rule of law, to human rights, to r extraordinary rendition policies or torture or, or Guantanamo, uh, I would argue, and I think many in Congress would believe, that America's strength comes from its own ability to inspire and be a model of these uh, on these issues and to be a champion of these basic democratic norms and freedoms. Uh, 
Senator Durbin started a program last year to champion one human rights detainee or one uh, political prisoner case every every few months uh, to start to make America that voice again around the world. And so we're championing a Gambian journalist who's been detained and, and some Turkmenistan political prisoners. And I think we need to do that again. Uh, there's, a, there's a hunger for that, I think, uh, in Congress as well. Thank you. Ted, I wonder if we can turn to you um, to offer some comments on how we might lean on multilateral you know, institutions, kind of taking the other end of the spectrum of this conversation. It's an area maybe we, we don't talk enough about, and what is it that you know, we can expect and we can offer, frankly, in those types of fora to, uh, to be helpful? Sure. I mean, we don't talk about it as much because I think it tends to put people to sleep, but <laughs> um, I'll try to make it a little lively and also reflect a little bit about uh, the president's trip to uh, Latin America, and which is an area I've been focusing on, and how Latin America can be an interesting uh, place to study directions for the future. I mean, I think it's clear that um, the President Obama is striking a very pragmatic, constructive engagement type of approach. And I think after what we've been through in the last several years, this is a, a good way to start. But it still opens a lot of questions. You know, what does this really mean? Um, and I think only time will tell. And certainly a lot of appointments still need to be made and people getting into their seats at the State Department and the White House. So we'll see how all that shakes out. Um, I, I think at least, though, you're getting in the door with uh, regimes, even regimes that we don't like, and, and having a discussion is probably a good place to start. Um, so why, why multilateralism? Uh, why do we think that's even a good approach? Well, I think in the case uh, where we stand right now, the U.S. position in the world, even though we've had this important historic election, we have a new president, um, and that alone, that demonstration, leading by example, is really powerful. So the tone is, is already shifting, and that's great positive. But we still, I think, need partners. Um, I think in terms of polling that you see around the world of uh, who are the credible actors, who, um, are, who, which institutions are seen as uh, positively by different publics around the world. You know, the UN ranks fairly high. The European Union ranks high. The Organization of American States. All of these do better than the United States. Now, that could be a hangover from the last several years, but there are some really strong historical trends behind those numbers, and I think we have to be cognizant of that. I think also just from a practical point of view, if you think from a grantee's position where you have so many don donors that you need to answer to and jump hoops for, um, it would be helpful to the grantees if the donors started pooling funds um, in a way that's different than what they're doing now. <clears throat> And I would point in particular, the report mentions the UN Democracy Fund as a, one example of this. It's now amassed almost $100 million from many different kinds of donors, almost all of them democracies, but including India, uh, has put in $20 million into this fund. And I think, you know, then it allows uh, NGOs, it's open to NGO civil society to go after that set pot of money with a set uh, rules, and I think that's a more efficient way of doing it. I think also if you mix up the kinds of democracy assistance that's provided, so it's not just an American brand, an American experience that's being shared with others, but a much more diverse set of experiences, uh, that's helpful. So you do need different kinds of players in the mix. You need you know, Brazil and India and South Africa and Indonesia and some of these countries to step up and be much more involved. So that's another reason why we should be more multilateral about it. Um, done a lot of work around the community of democracies, which a lot of people don't know that much about other than when John McCain talked about a league of democracies and suddenly people started talking about this idea of an alliance of democracies. <laughs> but the community of democracies does exist, and it has a, a, a more focused mandate than what John McCain was suggesting, which was a very broad kind of security-related agenda and even working on climate change, a whole set of things that the democracies would unite around. I, I don't think that's realistic at all. But democracies can work together on sharing lessons learned on democratization. And the organization is, is very slowly moving in this direction. And uh, it does now have a permanent secretariat. And I see Bronislaw is here. So if anyone's more interested in more information, Bronislaw is your man to talk to. Poland is the host of the permanent secretariat. 
uh, just yesterday we presented a report to uh, the governments that steer this body on which governments should be invited. And that's a, a process that's very sensitive but very important to the legitimacy of, of the body so that you have a common set of principles and values that are animating uh, the strategy. At the Organization of American States, I think you know there's a very strong um, support and and really legal and political doctrine that's been developed around shared democratic values, but it's under debate. It's being contested right now, and I'll come back in a minute to the Cuba issue and how that has evolved. But you know, you could going back to the model of the UN Democracy Fund, you could start creating regional pools of money. So you have an inter-American democracy fund, which would be a regional vehicle for um, groups in the region to work on a whole host of, <coughs> of democracy work. Um, now, th this really requires a mental shift on the part of, of all of us. You know, we're used to bilateral aid, and uh, that gives us more influence. But I think if we shift our, our attitude and see that there might be some value to multilateral tools, um, we're also going to be, uh, we also have to concede some, some influence. Um, it's going to be more demand driven and bottom up, which is very well covered in the report. I think that message really comes through. Um, but it should really be less political and we should have less control, which is inevitable. If you're going to pool funds, you're going to have less control. And that's a big step, I think, for us to take. And we're not used to it. So even, you know, your proposal to have um, the democracy assistance channeled into this development agency may not really go far enough. I would argue that for purposes of providing democracy assistance to civil society, it should not be done by the State Department or any other cabinet department. It should be done by NED and its institutes. Um, for state-to-state -state kind of funding assistance, where you're working with the Department of Justice in another country to help them with judicial training, then it could probably go through government-to-government -government channels. But I would like to see much more of an um, independent body handle the, the democracy assistance because it's inherently so, so political. Let me just wrap up by saying a word more about um, the trip and, and Cuba. Um, uh, my one concern, I think it's moving in the right direction. It's going to be slow incremental change. I think if you looked at what President Obama said in the last week or so, and his advisors on the Cuba issue, they did keep their eye on the ball as far as the, the democracy and human rights concerns that we all have. And, uh, but there are others in the inter-American community, including the Secretary General of the OAS, who are saying we should let Cuba back into the OAS and lift the suspension. And I think that would be a mistake, uh, a serious mistake, because it would really throw out decades of work that's been built up over time to build up these inter-American democratic <coughs> standards. How could you let Cuba into the OAS unless they changed their and met the standards that's laid out in the inter-American democratic charter? Uh, so I think it's great to have a dialogue with them and to start creating a path toward membership, but it's gonna, it should take time and we should hold on to those conditions. I'll stop there. Thank you. Um, Tom, I wonder if you can offer a perspective of kind of on the front lines, these groups working in the countries, they see the new administration coming in now and it's kind of first days of, <laughs> of deciding which direction it's going to go. What are they expecting um, coming out of the, the period of freedom agenda and, you know, what is going to be kind of some of the ways that they will interact with us going forward and we should interact with them. Okay. Um, uh, thank you, Maria and, and Michael, for uh, this project and for inviting uh, a number of us into it. Um, I think the report that has uh, resulted from it, this uh, brief report that you have before you today, is um, it, it bears reading and paying attention to, not least because it's a fresh voice. I think it's fair to say that uh, Maria and Michael uh, came to this subject uh, fairly recently. I mean, they're smart, international-focused people, but I think they're new to this particular uh, democracy promotion discourse. And I think it shows in the, in the language of the report, because you do take things from a different angle and you use different uh, words, and I think it's, it's refreshing. And too often we're uh, reading and rewriting one another's uh, papers and articles, <laughs> and uh, we don't really get new voices into this uh, often enough, and so I, I welcome you to it. And I'm glad you're here because I think this is a, 
uh, a bit of an iconoclastic report in some, some important ways in talking about revitalizing uh, how U.S. engages on democracy in the world. Um, I like many of the uh, recommendations and conclusions, and I believe much of what I've read in this report. Um, I, I think it's, um, e even though I'm a little bit variously agnostic, skeptical, or conflicted about some of the recommendations, like I don't know if a new Department of International Development is the way to go. Maybe it is. I don't like the acronym. You know, then we'd be, be talking about what the did did. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you know, we got to think about important things like that. Yeah, going, work on the name, okay? Going forward. Um, uh, and in some, so there's some other things I think we could continue to talk about and come to a more fully textured uh, consensus on. Um, I also would like to uh, offer another kind of demural at the beginning and say that as we look beyond the Bush administration's freedom agenda, I think it's become um, too easy in town here in the last 10 weeks to dismiss it altogether, to dismiss altogether what uh, George Bush and the freedom agenda did. Um, it is true, and Freedom House's um, annual survey of freedom in the world has documented this, that in the last three years, there have been, in each of those three years, more declines in freedom around the world than increases in freedom. And so we are now in the third or fourth year of a worldwide political recession uh, that predates and may be aggravating the economic recession that we're in. And so I think it's, it's real. There's really been some downturns in the world, but I think it's... Um, not fully accurate to attribute all the problems in the world in this regard to George W. Bush and the freedom agenda. Um, there are some bad governments out there who are repressing their own people and trying to move across borders and affect this international debate. The, the international norms and the international institutions that Ted just spoke about are venues for discussions about whether and in what ways democracy matters. And there are governments out there that are engaged very vigorously in trying to dumb down the standards and to say that non-democratic governance uh, is not only acceptable but may be preferred in some settings. And the United States needs to be engaged in those arenas in a more vigorous way, and I think the administration has set out to do that, and that's a good thing to engage on these battles. But we have to engage on these battles not simply to have dialogue and discussion but with a, a purpose in mind. But where do we want these discussions to come out? We want the, them to come out um, hopefully enhancing and strengthening the international norms that define human rights and democracy, but at least not dumbing them down any further. Because that's what's underway now in the OSCE, in the UN Human Rights Council, um, not so much yet in the OAS, but I think with the turning of a few governments <coughs> of late that that's a, a growing prospect. So we need to be in these arenas fighting for values and principles that matter to us, not just to be there to be, to be there. Um, so the nature of our multilateral engagement will be very important. But, and behind that is the fact that there are um, gr governments, and many of them in the last few years, uh, resource-rich, increasingly uh, assertive authoritarian governments that have pushed back against democracy, not because, or not just because George Bush was for it and they didn't like him, uh, but because they don't want democracy in their own countries, period. The regimes don't. And so I think we need to be focused on what the real problem in the world is. The real problem, the larger problem, is that there are anti-democrats out there trying to turn societies uh, in the wrong direction and in many cases are succeeding in the last three years. Uh, so that's a, I just, we, we need to be mindful of the larger environment as we turn to our own sort of uh, Washington uh, discussion about how we can organize ourselves to be better prepared for that. Um, what do uh, – we've, we've just had uh, – we have in the country right now at Freedom House, we have a group of 16 young Egyptian democracy activists uh, who've been in town and some of you have met and may, may meet yet. Um, this week we have several activists from Russia that we've been uh, bringing around town to meet people in the new administration at the NSC and the State Department and on Capitol Hill. Next week we'll have some uh, Zimbabweans here. So we're dealing just this month with exactly the kind of people you're asking about, Maria. And um, I would have to say that – they don't know much or care much about most of what we talk about, about whether there's more or less funding for MEPI versus DRL versus the NED versus AID, um, who's in charge, which agency reports to which other agency. I don't think they know or care much about that, frankly. Um, they know that they have friends in the United States, some of them in government, some were in the last administration, some are newly in the new administration that they uh, feel are friends of theirs. 
who share their values and their goals. Um, they know many of the civil society organizations uh, in Washington and around the country uh, that they feel are their friends and counterparts. You know, Freedom House and the National Endowment for Democracy and many other organizations uh, are in that mix. Um, and I think those are the people that they're more focused on. You know, the, more, the people who come and visit them more often and who, who engage in joint initiatives with them, um, they want to know that NDI and IRI and the ABA and Internews and the Solidarity Center will keep coming to their countries and keep working with them over time. How those groups get their money and whether it's from this agency or that agency or earmarked or not earmarked or um, you know, a contract or a grant, um, they don't much care about that. Um, and they shouldn't. They shouldn't have to worry about that. Uh, most of the people doing democracy promotion shouldn't have to worry too much about that. We spend over much time on that, I think, um, but we have to. Um, what they're looking for in the new administration initially is what they are saying in public. Uh, there's private meetings going on of the kind that we're facilitating these weeks. But what they're really looking for is what uh, the new president and secretary of state and others are saying in public when they go to major international venues or to their countries. And I think what they've already seen now in these first few weeks is um, kind of a moving target, a kind of learning process that's underway. Uh, I think we're all very focused on the fact that when uh, Secretary Clinton arrived at the State Department on her first day, she very famously talked about the three Ds of uh, defense, diplomacy, and development, and left many of us disappointed that democracy wasn't a fourth D that could have been easily added <coughs> to that, that refrain. Um, Vice President Biden, on the other hand, soon thereafter in a speech in Munich, uh, did use the fourth D word and talked about how to try to promote uh, democracy and development, very much in the way that your report does. I think one of the things that your report does <coughs> very well and in this kind of new voice that I mentioned <coughs> is to talk <coughs> in a matter-of-fact way about how uh, in a new reinvigorated development effort, democratization would naturally be a central part of that. I hope so. Um, I don't know that it's as foregone a conclusion as your report presumes it is, but I like the way you write it. <laughs> <coughs> and I hope it's true. Excuse me. <coughs> Excuse um, And so I think that uh, initially the the thing that people are looking at is what we say and how we, who we meet with. And in uh, engaging with governments around the world in a new invigorated way, both uh, friends uh, in Europe and elsewhere in Latin America and adversaries, <coughs> which I think is a good thing that the United States is re-engaging with all of these uh, governments around the world, it's important that in that new, new discourse with governments, we not lose track of our, our our American government commitment to the interests of those people, of the people in those countries, and I'm, you know, I was disappointed by the visit by uh, several members of Congress to Cuba recently, where they, they did the government outreach part, but they failed to meet with Democrats and dissidents in Cuba. I think that was a that was a huge omission, and it was very disappointing. Um, I hope that when um, President Obama goes to uh, Russia in uh, the summertime, as I understand he may well do. Uh, it's important that he establish a new strong relationship with uh, President Medvedev and others, but it's also important that he take time to meet with Democrats and dissidents in Russia, uh, as I hope he would do wherever he goes in the world. Um, and those things that may seem ceremonial or diplomatic or political are very important in setting the tone for the way our government operates. Um, I'll cut it short because I'm going to lose my voice momentarily. But I think that uh, it's, I think people see it's a work in progress. They hear uh, some speeches and some appearances. They're, they're, they're hearing the right things that are encouraging, that the best parts of the Bush administration's legacy will be continued. That is, a focus on dissidents and Democrats in uh, repressed countries uh, may continue. Um, in other cases, I think they're, they're concerned that they're not hearing enough of that. Um, so I think it's up to those of us who think that America's engagement in the world needs to be broader than just what our government does, uh, broader than just what our corporations do, uh, but must include more civil society to civil society, people to people, political exchanges and mutual support networks that we all, all continue in that. Um, and I would just conclude by echoing the 
remarks of others here today who have talked about the importance of the American example, that uh, how America comports itself internally and in our engagement in the world is <coughs> the first and most lasting impression we leave in the world. And I think that uh, in redressing some of the recent infringements on civil liberties that uh, have concerned us all, I also want to uh, encourage people to stand back and look a little bit at the larger picture, too, that America does present in most respects a very strong example. Not the model for every other place in the world, but a strong example of a dynamic self-correcting democracy in which we can have these kinds of debates. And it's worth recalling that uh, it is because we have a vigorous press and because we have an independent judiciary that the self-correcting mechanisms have already been taking place even prior to last November's elections. You know, we had courts in this country say to the executive branch no on certain infringements on civil liberties, including, <coughs> I think, very interestingly, military courts. We had military courts in the United States say to the President of the United States, no, these guys at Guantanamo have to have a lawyer. Uh, you know, they have to have a certain due process. Um, and so I think when we look at the American example, there's a lot that we can be proud of as Americans and we can feel comfortable sharing with the world, uh, even as we look for ways to try to improve our performance uh, uh, in many regards. Um, so I'll stop there. Maybe we can turn Thank to you. questions. Thank you. I'd like to go straight to questions from the audience, um, please. We have quite a wealth of expertise and, and uh, practitioners here in the room. So please, maybe we'll start in the way back. Please identify yourself. Uh, I was a little surprised. I spent 30 years in this town, 10 at the U.S. Information Agency, and I resonated when one of the panelists kind of took a shot at AID saying that it, it um, just gives money to a few big contractors. Uh, in my 10 years at USIA, I always apologized for our bureaucracy, and I was always reprimanded by people on the outside saying, oh no, you have no idea how much better you are than AID. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm a little surprised with a panelist even saying it's, a, it's not a well-run bureaucracy, but we should expand it dramatically for such an important mission. So I'd like to kind of have a response to that. A second, it's important to depoliticize democracy assistance. I'm wondering if linking it so directly to development assistance, one might have the result of politicizing development assistance. It would be a terrible thing if in efforts to, say, purify water or reduce infant mortality, <coughs> one gave the impression that was we were linking that to their political development or democracy. And it seems to me keeping them separate has a lot of merit. I wonder if anybody else has um, questions in these same types of topics, USAID or depoliticization. Well, I think this is connected. Would you identify yourself? Martha Turner and Activity Foundation. I, I know that there are a lot of very smart people, I'm thinking of Larry Diamond, for example, who, who think of democracy as an end in itself. Um, but I'm wondering whether and to what extent um, people in other countries that are trying to make a transition to democracy think of it that way. And in particular, I'm wondering uh, from Tom Milius whether um, part of the recession might be due to uh, a disappointment in expectations, not simply expectations having to do with um, <coughs> the United States' own conduct of its democracy at home, but, but with expectations uh, that people were led to uh, believe would occur with the transition of democracy, and whether to what extent these are um, uh, what we mean by democracy, <coughs> what others mean by democracy. I mean, do we mean elections? Do we mean human rights? Do we mean economic prosperity, markets? I'm not sure that there is a, a, a consensus on the <coughs> definition of this, but I, I, I do have the sense that some of this recession might be the result of just disappointed expectations and. Uh, Backsliding that occurs as a result of that. Okay, thank you. I would think there was one more related in the back. There. And then we'll take some answers, please. Uh, Charlie Brown, Institute for International Law and Human Rights, and also uh, the blog on diplomatic.net. Um, two quick observations. First one is, is that uh, fixing USAID <coughs> requires not just merely fixing the broader institution, but fixing the mechanics within the organization itself. 
I remember about 10 years ago going to a meeting where USAID was going to explain its new results-based performance evaluation, and they went through in great detail how, oh, if you just had, you know, if you want to vaccinate a thousand people, that's a results-based operation. And I raised my hand and I said, what if I want to fund a group of poets and rock and roll musicians to establish a government in, in Eastern Europe? And the woman said, well, I don't think we could do that because there's no way of, of quantifying that. So I think that while there are very many good people inside USAID, uh, the numbers crunchers still don't quite get democracy. Uh, my second point is, and this is especially pertinent given our first questioner, uh, there's another whole element that's missing from the report, and that is public diplomacy. Uh, public diplomacy is, well, let me put it this way. Back when I was running USAA programs for Freedom House, Tom, uh, many, many years ago, uh, I used to go overseas, and the people who knew more about what's going on in the ground were the public affairs officers in the embassy, knew much more than USAID, knew much more than the embassy, in large part because they were on the street and they were working with the democracy activists. And those, uh, the, you know, we talk about the degradation of USAID, but we really can't talk about effective democracy promotion without talking about the utter destruction of USIA. Do you want to start off? Well, um, you know, it's funny thing about the USIA. We, you're absolutely right. We, talk, we did talk much about public diplomacy in this report. I mean, one of the problems we saw over the past couple of years on that front was that you didn't have a very good product to sell. Um, and I think that's one of the reasons why, among other reasons, public diplomacy, uh, the effectiveness of it was pretty eroded over the past uh, uh, eight years. But I want to get to the, to the first question about AID. And, and I recognize the, the question is it, it points out a, a important par <laughs> the paradox in the report, which is that we sort of say AID is a broken agency, but we want to make it bigger. Um, and I think it's actually not that we want to get bigger, we want to, we want to fix it. And I think you know, from our perspective, you know, one example that just to sort of dramatize the point here, you know, in, in 2000, I think it was 2002, uh, the, the MEPI, Middle East Partnership Initiative, was created, State Department, which basically does a lot of the same similar programming that, that AID does. So why, why would you have that agency in state? It, 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 is it because you don't have trust your AID to, to do it effectively, that you think it'd be more effective through NEA at State Department? That may be the case. But... Um, my, my point would be, if, you, if you're going to have a development agency, then fix the development agency. Don't put programs elsewhere in, in the bureaucracy. Make sure the one you have actually operates well. And so what you have instead is a sort of fragmentation in the bureaucracy today, where you've got all these different power centers. You've got the Pentagon taking up a fifth of development assistance. Um, you've got MCC doing a chunk of this as well. And to, to my mind, you're not going to really fix the problem until you fix the underlying challenges that exist at AID. And that's not going to happen overnight. Um, but I think you have to begin with the decision. Do you, is it important for the U.S. to have a development agency that, that operates effectively? I think it is. So if so, how do you make that happen? And, and to my mind, you can't really make that happen unless you give AID a bigger seat at the table. And I should say, and, and to Tom's point to some extent, the, the degradation of AID is, is not something that I can lay at the feet of the Bush administration. This has been a bipartisan effort um, over many, many years. And I could actually put more blame on the Clinton administration um, for incorporating AID into state uh, than I even would on the Bush administration. So uh, you have to start <laughs> somewhere in this discussion. And to me, the place you begin is to recognize that it's important for U.S. foreign policy, particularly with the challenges that we are facing going forward, to have a development agency that operates effectively and does a good job. And, and, and you know, spends tax, taxpayer dollars effectively. We don't have that today. So. And I, I believe it was actually you that quoted Senator Leahy saying yes. it would become a pass-through. I yes. can tell you Senator Leahy, though, has been a real champion in trying to provide more funding for USAID. I don't think he meant that, that USAID was a, was a problem. Um, USAID has been politically marginalized. It hasn't been funded. It's, without that, has become uh, a place where different members of Congress have different pet projects that take up resources, and without sufficient overall funding, that, that causes a bottleneck in the agency. So I think what my boss and what others are arguing is you have to, this, it, needs, it needs help, it needs support, it needs more people, it needs resources, political muscle, uh, and we haven't done that at all. And, and, and all of this falls into the larger context of a very small foreign affairs budget for our U.S. government. It's only 1.4% of the budget or so. And you have all these competing needs in there from, from PEPFAR, Global AIDS, democracy, our, our foreign military assistance. And 
that overall top line needs to increase or we're never going to address some of these things. It's just like squeezing a balloon on all these competing needs that most of us would agree for, agree on. Any comments on the quantization of development assistance? Well, that's an interesting uh, question. Uh, it presumes that development assistance is somehow apolitical, I guess, which I'm, I guess I would argue the premise of the question, therefore, that um, you can do this in an apolitical way, that it, you know, that it's apolitical which part of the country you start your HIV AIDS in, uh, you know, your, your campaigns, your PEPFAR campaigns, where they start in a country is an intensely political process. You can't do that in an apolitical way. And the question is whether <coughs> in our development efforts we are listening only to governments and particularly only to governments that are not democratically grounded in doing the apolitical development programs. Um, I would recommend that when we establish the DID, or whatever it's going to be, or maybe even just try to improve the um, the USAID that uh, we have. Um, I'm often reminded of the excellent quote from uh, Secretary Rumsfeld that sometimes you have to go to war with the army you have rather than the army you wished you had. And I think to some extent we have to go to development with the agency we have rather than the ideal one that we wish we had and, you know, try to make it better uh, in some ways. And I think that's the premise of Chairman Berman's effort in the House where he's trying to rewrite the Foreign Assistance Act. Um, I think his starting point is not to create a new cabinet-level agency. It's to try to look at what's wrong with AID and try to fix it and define it in a better way. But in, in that effort of what he's embarking on and what, what we all might want to support. I hope people will look at this paper from last October that the Swedish government put out. They talk about their approach to development and they start and finish by describing it as rights-based development. Their interest is in advancing the quality of life for peoples in countries around the world that could use international assistance and they say sometimes governments may be helpful in that process and sometimes they'll be an impediment in that process. And we as the Swedish government uh, need to be able to tell which kind of government we're dealing with. And uh, so I would that's part of my answer to your question about uh, is, you know, democracy an end in and of itself. Um, y yes, it is. Uh, I think uh, there's, the, you know, the ability for people to live in freedom and make their own choices and be able to travel and talk and gather and choose their leaders, I think those are fundamental rights that I think are part of human development. And to separate them out from the more quantifiable physical fitness indicators, I think is, is, uh, is not right. I mean, I, I am a devotee of Amartya Sen's writing on this stuff where I think he's exactly right, you know, and there was that one brief moment five or six years ago when UNDP embraced Amartya Sen's uh, writings as the, uh, as a fuller description of human development than just what we can put on indicator charts. Um, so I think that has to be considered part of our interest in democratic development, that people be able to live in freedom for its own sake. Um, but it also has an instrumental value. It seems to me that in countries where there's more of a feedback loop, where people can participate in their own governance and be able to affect policies, that we're more likely to get closer to the right policies in, in our development efforts and other efforts than if <coughs> those people are silenced. And in too many countries, in a growing number of countries in the world, people don't get to choose their governments or pressure their governments to do what's useful to ordinary people. So I think democracy matters in order to get development uh, as well. Um, that's all. So just if I could jump in on, on this, a couple quick points. I mean, I actually do accept your premise. I think there is a risk of politicizing um, development assistance. Um, and that's why I think there should be more funding directed through NED and in more independent um, agents than through official government sources. Because as I said, democracy assistance is so inherently controversial and political. It's intervention in other states' internal affairs. That's what it is. Mm -hmm. Let's be honest about it. Um, and I think you have to um, support processes and not necessarily the end results. One of the problems has been over the last several years of trying to pick winners and losers in elections and putting our thumb on the scales. And if we can stand back from that and say we believe in democratic process and the rights behind it, and we know we might um, come out with a different government that may not align with our greatest interests. But um, it's if you believe in democracy, then it is fundamentally a choice of the citizens of that country that um, we have to live up to. So um, that's one thought. The other is, you know, the conflation of democracy and development is happening in the voters' minds as well, that their expectations are that democracy is going to deliver improved standards of living. And so democracy does have to deliver 
public services and public goods, but that's a, something the state needs to do for the most part. I mean, it can be done by different agents, but you need, in many of these cases, stronger states, actually. And so I think that's a critical part, but that's a development agenda. Um, and and that's going to um, that's a different way of looking at it. We didn't talk that much about MCC, but I would say MCC is another place where um, we could even say more in the report about it. I mean, I think the in, the incentive structure that was created, I think it's um, seems to be an important tool. Uh, I think it still needs more time. I don't know if Chris, you have anything to say about Congress's attitudes on this and and some weakness in the funding support. But it could also be a, a structure that could be multilateralized, and if not the MCC itself, then some other way of doing it. Certainly, it's helped Freedom House and others whose ratings are being used in making the development decisions, and I think that's a good that's a good thing. Lastly, on your comment about the don't the um, Democratic activists don't really care where the money comes from. I'm surprised to hear you say that because I I thought they really did care that if they have to brand their materials as USAID or from the U.S. government, walking around hostile environments, it actually hurts them as counterproductive. And so it does matter that the funding comes through um, other agents. No, uh, well, point taken. You said better what I intended to say, which is that, um, yeah, if it comes funding or cooperation or programs come from uh, civil society counterparts, that's what they're looking for. Um, in rare occasions, they want to be seen to be uh, partners of the U.S. government in certain settings because it's valuable or protective for them. But I, I agree, most of the time, they'd rather not be seen as funded by or and the impl implication is that they're directed by uh, the U.S. government or other donor agencies. I think that's, that's right. I, I have to just make one point that Chris was talking about the um, the international affairs of budget. And, you know, I was sort of struck by this. We had a, a big debate in this town a few weeks ago um, about the defense budget, and people were hailing Secretary Gates for actually cutting defense spending programs, you know, cutting uh, the F-22 and so on. And yet, we increased the defense budget by 4%. We're spending $650 billion in defense budget. Um, at the same time, they're arbit arbitrarily, uh, the Budget Committee is cutting money from the national affairs budget, and it was, in fact, the intervention of Secretary of Defense, again, to stop that from happening. Um, so part of the, the challenge here is that you, you need to shift the terms of debate a little bit away from uh, viewing the military as, as the key uh, focus of our foreign policy to our civilian agencies. And, and part of, you know, the, the, this isn't a, a dig at the military as much as it is a recognition that the, the balance has shifted so, so dramatically toward the military and away from the civilian agencies um, that until you can have a real conversation about what you want these agencies to do and, and why they're important and why in some ways you could argue they are um, as important, even in some ways more important um, than our military budget when it comes to getting the kind of outcomes that we're trying to get overseas, uh, you're not going to really be able to change this, this entire conversation the way you need to. I dodged the MCC question three or four times. <laughs> why don't I try to answer it from the Hill's perspective? Um, I think the MCC question is actually one that takes place in a much larger context on the Hill. For those that follow the MCC on the Hill, I think there's general support that it's a, it's a good model. It forces a certain number of standards or benchmarks on countries as multi-year funding. This is a good way of engaging countries that can meet those standards. But there are larger issues at play. Do we create yet another kind of sub-agency or send extra money to MCC when, when USAID is, is not getting nearly enough by, by tenfold, perhaps? Um, what about countries that have horrible records? Uh, or can't meet those standards, but have huge humanitarian needs, Burma, Zimbabwe, or so forth. Do we not engage those? Uh, somebody in the back mentioned something like that. I don't think we can stop engaging those. So the MCC is not a, a model for all, of, for all of those as well. And it goes back to the larger budget debate, too. Uh, I think MCC's model, MCC sometimes has its money taken away in, at the end of the year, not because people don't like the model, but it's because there's, no, there's not enough money in the, in the international affairs budget. And so if they have some extra reserves sometimes that haven't been allocated, sometimes that happens. But it's not as a criticism of MCC. This gentleman over here.
I'm Bronislav Mistal, I'm with the Community of Democracies, and <coughs> actually what I would like to say is that I sense a sort of uh, two, different, um, uh, two different strands in this discussion, and to summarize them, I would say that one, you are discussing basically whether there is a product to be delivered, and for me, the, your discussion is pretty much a discussion between whether to use the uh, USPS or uh, Federal Express, which means that there is a package, and you need to deliver the package. What is in the package? American money. Okay, that's one thing. Uh, now, this has been highly debated. Uh, and um, of course, for the government, it is uh, a, an issue of institutionalization of uh, foreign aid, uh, whether this way or another way. It will always be a matter of whether this is a Federal Express or another company. Now, I believe uh, we are dealing with another issue here, and I'm, uh, of course, grateful to Ted Picone from raising uh, some of those issues. I believe that pretty much as, as, um, as far as we have uh, a financial crisis in this country, in, in this world, which results from the fact that um, the system has become so complex that uh, we have had institutions like uh, USPS and Federal Express and what have you to launch uh, so many different financial instruments that nobody understands what's being floated. I believe that in terms of democracy, we have uh, had so many different concepts that we differ as far as what is being floated. Now, many countries, from my eight months experience with the community of democracies, many countries are asking the question about what democracy is. And I would say that as much as um, economically speaking, we are dealing with a complete <coughs> epistemological vacuum in this country. As far as democracy is concerned, we're dealing with epistemological vacuum as well. Now, you may remember that President Clinton came to power by saying it's the economy stupid. I would uh, sort of uh, provide you with a different version, and I would say that maybe today we would need to start by saying it's, a, it's the democracy clever, and we need to... <laughs> Uh, first of all, to start treating uh, different countries, entities, not just governments, with respect. Then we need to assume that um, the fact that we send a package, whether it's USPS or Millennium Challenge Corporation or Federal Express or whatever, does not guarantee that the package is going to be delivered, that it will be received, and that it will be put to good use. So we need to make sure that those concepts that we are sending are actually uh, somehow country and uh, culture and, uh, and uh, region specific. And I believe that this is a tremendous task that is in front of us. Thank you very much. Um, I think drawing on some of the themes, uh, uh, Mary Speck, I'm a, a journalist and historian, and mainly I've covered Latin America. And uh, you mentioned. Um, pushback, I think, um, uh, from authoritarian governments, but there's also been some pushback, I think, um, on the part of democratic governments. And this has certainly been true, um, I think, in Latin America. So I just wanted, um, perhaps Ted could go in a little more detail about what the possibilities really are for multilateral um, action, um, whether there's enough agreement, really. I mean, there may be some UN agencies, I, I'm, I'm not that familiar with their work, particularly, as you mentioned, the controversy over Cuba, that's the most obvious one, where there are real differences on how to deal um, with Cuba. And there are real differences right now in Latin American democracies. Um, all of them call themselves democracy, but there's a real difference in attitude toward democracy in Latin America. So how really is there an appetite outside of the United States for democracy promotion, and is there enough agreement, um, even within our own region, um, on what democracy is uh, and how to promote it uh, to, to, to multilateralize this? I'd like to take a few more questions because I saw so many hands up over here, but if you could uh, hi, uh, Dan Brumberg, uh, Georgetown University and USIP. I, I have a lot of friends and colleagues. I'm one of the older, the older group that Tom mentioned, uh, who has been working on these issues for many years, with a whole variety of organizations. I, I think, it, first of all, I, on the issue of USAID, I think it has to be recognized that inoculating people against malaria and promoting democracy are two different sciences, and we don't have a curriculum. I, I'm the director of democracy studies at Georgetown. Tom has taught for us there, and. It's a challenge coming up with a, with, a, with a science of democracy promotion, consolidation, governance, and the rest of it. And we're working with USAID now on this very problem. 
uh, it started as an organization which wasn't concerned with this particular issue. So we have to recognize what the job ahead of us in, in, in addressing this very issue. So I think that's one thing we have to recognize. The other thing is when I'm, I, I would agree with the focus in part on civil society, but I think we're, I think we're missing a, a key component of this, this problem that I've been working on for a long time, and that is autocracies love civil society organizations because what they want to do is split up oppositions and weaken oppositions and, and make sure that political society doesn't, doesn't gather, gather momentum. So in, at least in the neck of the woods I work in, which is the Arab world, civil society organizations uh, are not necessarily the key because what these regimes want to do is make sure they have enough capacity to divide the opposition and that is done through civil society. Uh, so a demand-based approach, <coughs> which doesn't focus on the supply, is not going to work. We have to recognize, and this is not what I'm hearing from the panel, that part of the problem is the supply of democracy from states and the macro conditions they create for democratization and authoritarianism. And if we're not willing to say to the new administration that on some level, and this is a matter of public diplomacy in part, we have to continue pressuring states for democracy, all this notion of pumping more money into civil society organizations, I think, is going to just be a waste because these organizations don't have the capacity. We're demanding too much of them. The issues of political par parties, we know, are not civil society organizations. They cannot carry out the burden of civil society organizations. But parties operate in an environment created by states. So if we're not willing to push states on constitutional reform, on the basic production, supply of democratization, I think that we're, we're, we're not getting to the heart of the issue, that I think this has to be reflected in our message to the administration. This gentleman's been waiting, yes. Thank you. My name is Frank Smythe. I'm with the Committee to Protect Journalists. It's a great panel. And nice to see you, Chris. And uh, one of the recommendations you make in the report, which I agree is quite iconoclastic, or it seems to be from what I've seen of it, is that the, the, the United States should end illegal detentions. And one of the things the Committee to Protect Journalists has raised with then President-elect Obama and now with the administration is the fact that the U.S. military has held at least 14 journalists in Guantanamo Bay, Iraq, and Afghanistan for weeks, days, for weeks, months, or years without habeas corpus. We're hoping that President Obama may address this on World Press Freedom Day within two weeks. And in the letter that we sent to, pres to President-elect, we quoted Senator Durbin making comments, I forget the actual quote, but indicating that the U.S. is a standard bearer of press freedom has dropped, and we also quoted Senator Lugar, who made similar uh, remarks at an NED event last year. So the question is, for those, for Maria and uh, and Michael, who wrote the report, do you think that ending the U.S. military's detention of journalists without habeas corpus should be part of the illegal detentions that are ended? And I wonder, Chris, from your own perspective, not not Senator Durbin's, if you think this is something Senator uh, President Obama should address and whether that might help sort of uh, uh, raise the U.S. standard uh, around the world. Thank you. Can I take a round of comments? I would answer yes to what you just, you just asked, absolutely. And again, I mean, to the point that we made in the report and I made earlier, I mean, this question of the U.S. example and all everyone's talked about, I mean, this, again, is the most pervasive theme that we came across on everybody that we, we spoke to. Um, it so diminished the U.S. ability to be an effective voice for democracy around the world. And, and we're talking about public diplomacy, and I think that's a crucial part of this conversation. But if you are <coughs> – one of the, the, the recommendations we make in the report is we need, we need to tone down some of the rhetoric and how we talk about democracy. Um, we need to stop uh, you know, making sort of democracy the end-all, be-all. And, and also, not that democracy isn't important, but also recognizing that the trajectory for democratic development is, is a long one and to recognize that there are going to be uh, um, uh, problems along the way, but we have to not lose our, put, take our eye off the ball. And, and I think Tom mentioned the point about Eastern Europe, and we are, you know, 20 years from there, we're still building institutions in Eastern Europe for democracy, and that's how we need to think about democracy. Um, and I think Kenya was an example of this recently. Uh, you know, the, the, the process of democratic evolution in places like Kenya or elsewhere, it, take, it's, it takes a long, long period of time for this to happen. And we need to, you know, that's one of the reasons why you need to think of this as a long-term objective as opposed to uh, a short-term uh, considerations. Absolutely. I think the press freedom goes with the freedom to vote or run for office Absolutely. or public assembly. It, it belongs right up in there. Other thoughts? Well, on, on the Latin America democracy, it's a very good question. Um, you know, if you start from the premise that there is a basic understanding of human rights principles that governments have signed up to. 
in the inter-American system, at the UN level, certainly Universal Declaration of Human Rights and other treaties. It, it, that's your starting point. So governments have signed up to these norms, right? So we can hopefully agree that that's in agreement. But then it takes many different forms as to how it's practiced. And Latin America has really become more diverse uh, lately. And that's a large part because <coughs> of the democratic process has opened the political space for marginalized groups to be involved in the political system in new ways and are, and are gaining power as a result. And that is shaking up the system. And it's um, shaking up a lot of uh, uh, trend, entrenched interests as well. And so there's a lot of controversy and there's a lot of potential for violence actually. Um, I think uh, in, in, in general terms, it's a healthy process, but um, there are some leaders that clearly have an authoritarian uh, bent to it. And we've just recommended that countries like Venezuela and Nicaragua not be invited into the community of democracies. There's a charter that lays out the criteria for participation in the community of democracies. And, and these countries, they, under this current regimes, don't qualify. Um, so I think you have to be clear about where the lines are and say, you know, this, you, you no longer meet the test. So um, with those governments, you, you're not going to find much common ground um, in promoting democracy because we have a different view, really, of what it means. And, and we think that if you keep going back to what the, the language means, the universal norms, then that's your safe harbor and you can really have an honest, an honest debate. As far as how we work with... Uh, the region on, on Cuba, I mean, some of these governments like Brazil or Chile or Mexico are really going to need to help us um, on this. That it, it can't just be, um, um, oh, U.S., you lift the embargo and then we'll talk to you about it. That's just not going to work. And so I think um, I'm hoping that Obama is spending some time and some political capital with some of those countries that could be helpful, that do want to see a change. Uh, in Cuba, but want to do it very carefully and don't rush into, um, l for example, letting Cuba back into the OAS. Um, I just want to pick up on Bronislav's uh, comment about uh, FedEx versus uh, UPS um, and the money question. Um, I think that's uh, an interesting insight into our conversation here, um, which <laughs> has, uh, what it prompts me, it reminds me that uh, we have in this discussion talked more about AID or the DID and the money and how much there is. Um, there may well be enough money being spent on democracy promotion right now. Mm. You know, it may not be a question of more money. It's the way we utilize it mm. um, and how that fits into the larger engagement in the world, the public diplomacy, what public officials do, um, what how we engage other institutions. And so I would, um, so I think that's, uh, uh, the, and actually, the, the report does a better job than we have in this conversation of talking about the broader dimensions of American engagement in the world in this regard. And so I think you know, I'd recommend you read the full report. Uh, it does talk more about the other aspects of diplomacy uh, and so on, uh, which I think are vital to this. Uh, too often we do just get down to the budgets and the bureaucracy, and we forget that this is not about projects. I mean, if we, if we let democracy promotion or democracy assistance be thought of simply as a bunch of projects, then it, it's, it's not about um, American broader societal engagement in the world. It's really just about projects. Um, and, and that sort of goes to Dan's point about um, civil society and the way that autocracies can use that to, uh, as an alternative to political opposition or can foster it in order to confuse the issue. I think that's right. And what you said, I think, uh, what I heard you to say is that our government needs to be clear in its speaking to those governments about you know, pressuring them to uh, accommodate uh, voices within their societies. I mean, that is the role of government. I think the role of the State Department is not to manage grants. The role of the State Department is to do diplomacy with governments, both friendly governments and with adversarial governments. Uh, so we should have engagement and diplomacy with governments uh, as much with the ones we don't like as with the ones that we do like. You know, it was um, Yitzhak, Yitzhak Rabin who famously said in response to some of his critics, uh, you don't negotiate with your friends, you negotiate with your enemies. Uh, so get out there and negotiate. You know, let's do it. Let's go to Iran, let's go to Cuba. I think we should do all that. Uh, on Cuba, uh, it's an odd and oddly incomplete policy that so far has been announced by the Obama administration. Um, because I don't have Cuban relatives, I can't travel to Cuba. Yeah. It's, first, it's the only policy I know that in which travel is based on ethnicity. 
you know, why, why can only people with Cuban relatives go to Cuba? That's bizarre. Uh, let's go to Cuba. Let's all go to Cuba. <laughs> <laughs> is Freedom House paying for that? Yeah. Uh, I just want to pick up on, on, on this point, and this is about civil society. You know, one of the really dangerous developments that's happened in the past couple of years is, is the extent to which authoritarian, semi-authoritarian regimes are cracking down on civil society, but on NGOs in general. You saw this in Russia with the NGO law. You've seen this in Central Asia. Um, Ethiopia, uh, a number of places of basically creating their own civil society organizations or basically interfering with the work of civil society groups. And I think that the U.S. response needs to be much more vigorous to this. It, this, this, this should be a, a red line for U.S. diplomats, or for U.S. diplomacy. And I think, you know, one example that came across in, was in Bahrain, for example. Bahrain kicked out the NDI a couple of years ago. And the State Department issuing demarche after demarche at the same time that the Commerce Department is sending business missions to Bahrain, and the military is continuing their, mili their engagement with the Bahraini military. That's not acceptable. And so, you know, if, if we recognize that civil society and, and, and NGOs play an incredibly <coughs> important role in seeding democracy, then our diplomacy has to defend those, those actors much, much more effectively than we have. And I'll just mention um, Mike Allen and, and David Lowe here from NED, who've written a lot on this topic and have, and have really highlighted this issue. It's, it's a really significant problem, and it, it needs more attention from, from our State Department. I know there are many other hands in the air. We've come to the end of our, our time. Shall I take another round? We have a few minutes, yeah. Then we'll, we'll do the last three questions. No. Thank Thanks very much. I'll be brief. David Lowe from the aforementioned NED. Um, I want to go back to Michael's. One of Michael's original comments was that we are spending, one of the biggest problems in this field is that we're spending too much in the wrong countries. And I want to sort of put you on the spot. If you had the authority to dramatically increase funding in, say, three countries, actually, I'd like to, whoever else wants to pick up on this, too, what <coughs> countries would those be and why? Hi, uh, Camille Ice with the Truman National Security Project. Um, hi, Tom. Hi, Camille. Uh, <laughs> my question um, is uh, about the findings and the conclusions of the administration's recent uh, Afghanistan-Pakistan review and plans going forward for greater collaboration between the military and the civilian sector and intentions to bring in more civilian players, particularly to strengthen institutions in Afghanistan. And I'm curious to hear um, your opinions on whether that can be a productive partnership going forward and, and if that's productive for uh, the cause, the greater cause of democracy promotion um, in light of things over the last few years and, and changing perceptions. Okay. One last comment there. Okay. Yeah, Michael Allen also, also with the net. Um, I guess the, uh, obviously I uh, fully endorse the report, especially the proposal to increase resources for the organization that pays my salary. So um, kudos for that. But I guess the one uh, cautionary note I'd, I'd raise is that the prescription, in terms of the prescriptions for the tone uh, in which democracy assistance is, is discussed, particularly in policy terms, I think, yes, people are understandably suggesting that we should tone down the rhetoric after some of the... Um, <coughs> arguably excesses of, of, of recent years. However, I'd be concerned that that did not lend itself to generating some too much political timidity, should we say, um, in this field, particularly given the, in the, given the context of the, the backlash that has been mentioned and the, uh, the new aggression on the part of authoritarian powers. Um, and I'm also a little wary about this argument about depoliticizing democracy assistance. I was talking to one of our grantees from the Lebanon recently who was bemoaning the fact that uh, Hezbollah are able to act uh, and deploy Iranian and other sources of assistance much more rapidly and to much greater political effect than they can, partly because the kind of resources that Ned can provide pale into comparison with what they get from Tehran, um, but also because they clearly, Hezbollah and similar non-state actors are not bound by USAID uh, criteria and rules of engagement and so on and so forth. Uh, and the final point I'd say is that the kind of democracy assistance that's prescribed in the report, again, is very cogently argued and very refreshing, as Tom said, 
but it looks uh, very much like a European approach to democracy assistance. You know, the Europeans are always saying this is a generational task. Uh, we need to uh, be uh, lower expectations, be uh, humble about what we can promise. And ironically, in Europe now, policymakers and certainly civil society activists and democracy assistance groups have developed their own critique saying that Europe should be more assertive and is failing to take advantage of opportunities and has wasted huge amounts of resources, uh, not least in its uh, southern periphery in the, uh, in, the, in the Arab world, where these authoritarian regimes have realized that they, they know how to game the democracy assistance uh, business now. They know that they can receive... As, as, as Dan Bumberg said, vast amounts of assistance for civil society organizations. And they all pay obeisance to the argument that, yes, democratization is a gradual process. But as Madeleine Albright once said, you know, we have to distinguish be between gradual and glacial. <laughs> Can I take uh, your comments on the top three countries? Uh, I'm, I'm not going to pick the top three because I'm sure I'm going to lose somebody off and get, and get, and get attacked for that. I, I will say, you know, one of the the arguments we make in the report is that we need to, we have, we're talking about a very small amount of resources. We're talking about $1.5 billion, I think, last year in democracy assistance funding, um, you know, which might put, like, you know, one, one wing on an F-22. It's not a lot of money. Uh, and so I think that resources need to be focused more um, effectively to, to those countries that have, have really further along on the sort of democratic trajectory. Um, I think... Especially in countries where corruption is, is and, and in many of these places, talk about corruption is a huge issue. I'm not so sure that resource flows is the best way to help. Uh, I think uh, you know, this is some sort of cannibalizing Paul Collier's argument a little bit, but I think technical assistance and and, and creating institutions that might be a more effective way to go forward than simply uh, providing more money. And I think that you know uh, what worries me a little bit is when we see money being used sort of politically for places sort of like North Korea or or Myanmar or Burma uh, or Iran that I just don't see it having a lot of impact and, in fact, squandering precious resources that could be used much more effectively um, elsewhere. We have to recognize that, you know, even though we talk about more money, we are talking about a very small, a very small pot of funds here, and it needs to be used as effectively as it, as it possibly can. I'll pass. Okay. <laughs> um, I will uh, rise to the bait on where I would put more resources, but it wouldn't just be financial. It would be uh, political and diplomatic attention as well. Again, going back to what we talked about a moment ago. Um, and thinking in market terms about the global political recession in which we find ourselves, I would try to shore up uh, recent gains and protect earlier investments by uh, guarding against further backsliding or downturns in some key places. Uh, and there's a longer list, but the first three that come to mind are uh, Mexico, South Africa, and Indonesia. Um, you know, Indonesia gets a lot of good press these days, and I think justifiably so, but I think it could go badly quickly. Uh, Mexico is very complicated, very close, very important. Um, <coughs> South Africa has a lot of resonance in, in the African continent and is slowly drifting in a very <coughs> disconcerting direction. It, it may get corrected with more political pluralism that may be demonstrated in the forthcoming elections, but uh, even longer term, I think there's a need for shoring up sort of democratic political culture in all of these places and the institutions that, that safeguard them. Um, on, uh, there was another question, but. Um, Afghanistan. Oh, Afghanistan and Pakistan, yeah, that's really too hard. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Camille, Camille just said that in order to sort of embarrass me. Uh, that's a longer discussion than we have time for. I'll be very brief. I mean, I, I agree with the general idea that you want to start, you want to work with countries that are already on a democratic path that are democratizing. But I would, I would also think about some countries that are maybe too big to fail, and and so. Um, even if they're not completely on the democratic path. Even if they've already yet. failed. Yeah. <laughs> well, um, China, because China's the future. Um, Pakistan, because Pakistan's just too important and we've got to deal with... Yeah, that's, um, that's not going to fail. Um, it, that's the whole problem. It might fail. And that's why uh, you've, got to, uh, you've got to address it at the, on the whole comprehensive strategy front, including democracy, and then, and then Russia. Um, this last point, uh, Michael, I... I I think maybe there's a happy middle between the U.S. loudmouth approach and the European too soft approach because, and it has to be very country specific and nuanced because we've seen in some cases like Zimbabwe or Venezuela that the regime has used the, the U.S. Um, pronouncements on, on democracy 
to their advantage and painted oppositions as, you know, you're against the, you know, the common good, the greater good of the country and attack people as spies, et cetera. And, and so we have to be really careful about how we do it. And that's why I think we need to kind of walk quietly, talk softly sometimes and hold hands with others so that we're not the only ones talking. And with that, I'll, I'll thank our panelists, um, Ted, Tom, Chris, and Michael. And remind you, there are reports in the back, and we welcome your comments. Thank you. Thank you for participating. <laughs>